The Tom Woods Show, episode 475. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey, everybody, if you've been meaning to start that blog or website, but you don't know what your first steps are, then check out the free ebook I created for you, taking you step by step through the process, including a free video tutorial showing you how to get a blog up and running in just five minutes. Plus, if you check out tomwoods.com slash publicity before starting up that blog, I'll give you some free publicity right out of the gate. So check it all out, the free ebook, the video tutorial, and the publicity offer at tomwoods.com slash publicity. Hello, everybody. Tom Woods here. What an honor it is today to have joining us Stephen M. Walt to talk about the Iran deal, because I've been getting a lot of commentary in my Facebook feed from people who are dead set against it, and it's going to give the Iranians a nuclear weapon and this and that. So I thought we could bear to hear a little bit more about it. And... Professor Walt had an article on this subject in Foreign Policy. You can read it at foreignpolicy.com. I'll have the exact link on today's show notes page, tomwoods.com slash 475, called The Myth of a Better Deal. So I thought this was an appropriate moment to invite Professor Walt onto the show to help us understand a little bit better what's going on, particularly because of all the people I'm reading who are saying it's a terrible deal and it's going to do all kinds of terrible things. Let's try and get a sober analysis of what's going on here. Stephen Walt is a professor of international affairs at Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government. He previously taught at Princeton University and the University of Chicago. He has served as a consultant for the Institute of Defense Analyses, the Center for Naval Analyses, and the National Defense University. He presently serves on the editorial boards of Foreign Policy, Security Studies, International Relations, and Journal of Cold War Studies. And he also serves as co-editor of the Cornell Studies in Security Affairs, published by Cornell University Press. He was elected as a fellow in the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in May 2005. Professor Walt is the author of numerous books, most famously as co-author, The Israel Lobby, published in 2007. Professor Walt, thanks so much for being with us. Nice to be talking with you. I read your article that I've just been telling people about, about um, magical thinking with regard to the, the what well, you call it, the myth of a better deal with regard to the Iran deal. And uh, before we talk about that Iran deal, tell me what you mean by magical thinking, because it's a concept that can be applied to many scenarios, including the war in Iraq itself. Well, I mean, uh, the, essentially analysis or prescriptions or people offering policy advice that's based on uh, essentially no clear statement of actually what's causing what. Uh, it usually involves uh, unspecified uh, causal relationships, uh, no real supporting evidence, and in almost all cases, a certain naive optimism that everything will work as planned. Uh, so when someone indulges in magical thinking in foreign policy, it's saying, you know, here's a problem and we can solve it by you know, sort of waving our hands and adopting a, a course of action for which there's no real reason to believe it's going to work. We're just going to take it on faith. Um, and that uh, happens in lots of cases. Lots of different countries have fallen victim to it. But in particular, I uh, argued that the opponents of the deal with Iran have indulged in magical thinking by basically saying, gee, we could have gotten a better deal without ever specifying exactly how that would be achieved. What are the primary complaints about the deal that we hear from critics? I, I mean, I get, I get a lot of... Uh, people in my Facebook feed, unfortunately. I must have, at some point in my life, indiscriminately added people, because I've got people who are absolutely up in arms about this deal for a variety of reasons. What are the most common ones you see in, let's say, policy circles? Uh, I think the most, uh, the, the two or three most uh, prevalent uh, objections is, first of all, that this does not eliminate all of Iran's nuclear infrastructure. Uh, the original American position going back to the 
early 21st century was that Iran had to eliminate its entire enrichment capacity, dismantle all of its nuclear centrifuges and basically make it physically impossible for them to either enrich uranium or acquire plutonium and therefore make it physically impossible for them ever to have a nuclear weapon. Uh, the Iranians have said consistently for 15 years that that was not uh, something they would ever accept, that they had a right to enrich uranium as a signatory of the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Uh, other countries around the world had these capabilities as well, and that therefore the idea of no enrichment capacity whatsoever was simply uh, something they were never going to accept. Now, in the period, you know, sort of 2000 to 2013 or so, the United States it was insisting Iran had to give up all its capacity. And in that period, Iran went from having zero nuclear centrifuges to having 19,000. So the American goal was, was clearly not being achieved. And what we've done with this deal is uh, knock back Iran's capacity from 19,000 to roughly 6,000 centrifuges, reduce their stockpile by 97%. Uh, and all of this means that if they were at some point in the future decide they wanted to try and acquire a nuclear weapon, it would take them at least a year uh, to do that. And we would, of course, be aware of what they were attempting to do throughout that uh, entire period. That's, I think, the principal objection. Um, there are some other objections you occasionally hear that this is rewarding Iran, that uh, by lifting the sanctions, they're going to get uh, an infusion of money, uh, money that's been kept essentially in escrow, that it's Iranian money, but we've been holding it, uh, and that that will allow them to do uh, lots of bad things uh, subsequently. Uh, again, then the question is, would you rather have this supposedly dangerous Iran with a nuclear capability, or would you rather have it with nuclear capability blocked off? I think those are the two. Uh, main objections. You also hear a few people talk about, you know, they're not entirely happy with the monitoring or inspections, uh, but I think most experts actually believe this is a, a remarkably airtight uh, agreement from the perspective of knowing what Iran is up to and being able to respond to it if need be. I do seem to recall hearing people saying that after the ink was dry on the agreement, you know, well, we had been told that American inspectors could go in anytime they wanted to, and now we're being told they can't, and this goes, goes to show Iran is not dealing with us in good faith. Now, uh, that's something that I just remember as a basic impression from something I read. I have no details on that. Do you know what that is all about? Yeah, that, I think that's just completely not true. I mean, the inspections are going to be conducted by the International Atomic Energy Agency, which has been doing nuclear inspections, uh, you know, for decades now, is very good at it. Uh, the technology of monitoring a nuclear facility has also uh, improved dramatically as we've gotten uh, more and more uh, capacity uh, to do that. Um, the uh, level of monitoring on uh, Iran's existing facilities is going to be more extensive than I think any other country in the world. Um, so the likelihood that they would be able to cheat in any meaningful way and and we would not be able to detect it, I think, is is remote. Um, and as a, a colleague of mine likes to point out, you know, suppose we, uh, you could think of this as uh, we have an agreement that I Iran uh, – Imagine this were an agreement that it forbid Iran from ever building a car, right? Well, in order to build a car, you have to build a lot of different things. And if we found uh, at some point that, you know, gee, it looked like some Iranians were actually working on trying to figure out how to make a spark plug. Um, the fact that they were able to make a spark plug didn't mean that they would then be able to make a car if they couldn't do all the other components as well. Um, one final point is that you have to, I think, go into this obviously not trusting Iran. That's why we have monitoring. That's why we have a verification uh, uh, procedures. But you do have to assume that it is in Iran's interest to abide by the agreement uh, as well. Uh, there's no evidence, for example, that Iran is dead set on getting a nuclear weapon at all. They haven't been working on nuclear weapons for at least a decade, according to uh, the American intelligence community. There are good reasons, in fact, why Iran would probably prefer to be short of actually crossing uh, the nuclear threshold. And the consequences for them to, uh, to renege on this agreement would be really quite substantial because one of the cleverest parts of the agreement is 
that the United Nations sanctions that have put the most pressure on Iran can be automatically reimposed if any of the signatories, and that means us, uh, unilaterally decide that Iran has uh, reneged on the agreement. We don't have to get another vote from the Security Council. There's no possibility of a Russian or a Chinese veto. And this was a very clever arrangement to make sure that the concern that maybe sanctions wouldn't snap back if Iran cheated or it might take a long time to get them back in place uh, isn't a concern. In fact, if we decide in two years that they're not meeting the terms of the agreement, we can essentially unilaterally reimpose the sanctions and it would require a unanimous vote of the Security Council, which we could veto, uh, to uh, lift the sanctions subsequently. Uh, so in that sense, I think you have to go into it recognizing that Iran has uh, very real interests in, in living up to the agreement as well. I've heard a number of people point, though, to the type of rhetoric we hear coming from Iran. They, they'll say, we hear Iranians sh shouting, death to America, death to Israel, and these are people whose nuclear program we're going to be satisfied not closing down completely? We should listen to them and take them at their word when they pledge to destroy us. This is, this is typical red meat, uh, neoconservative talking point type of language. What would you say to that if you were confronted with that? Well, I'd say sort of two or three things. I mean, first of all, uh, this is not a deal that resolves all the differences we have between Iran and ourselves. It was never intended uh, to do that. And similar to the arms control agreements that we met, uh, we had with the former Soviet Union, which was our avowed enemy, we decided we would be uh, safer and more secure with those agreements than without. But it didn't end the rivalry between the two countries. Um, that would be sort of point number one. Second, if, you, if your image of Iran is that it's a you know, relentlessly anti-American, hostile, uh, aggressive state, you want to ask yourself the question, would you like that state to have an open path to a nuclear weapon, or would you like that state to be unable to get a nuclear weapon for at least a decade and par possibly beyond? I would prefer that second world if I had a, a really uh, you know, a horrific image of Iran as an aggressive state. And the final thing I'll say is that uh, this is, I think, a caricature of Iran as a society. It's actually quite a diverse society. It has its extremist hotheads in it, uh, the same way we have some extremist hotheads here in the United States. Um, but in fact, Iran has not been attacking other countries, something uh, the United States has done on on occasion in, in recent years. And though uh, some of its activities we find uh, very objectionable, um, I think it's uh, misleading to characterize uh, all of the Iranian society and every Iranian as sort of getting up in the morning thinking bad thoughts about uh, America and working 24-7 to try and think of horrible things they could do to the United States or to its allies. I think there is a third option, though. You give the option of we, Iran could either have a clear path to a nuclear weapon and there'd be no oversight, or we could have this deal. The third option would be war. And that's why I think that the people you accuse in your article of believing in magical thinking because they think there could have been a better deal, I don't, I'm not sure that all of those people are really arguing in good faith. I think what they're really saying is, if we couldn't get the perfect deal, then to heck with it, we should just go to war with them. Right. And, and um, I mean, th that has always been the sort of third possibility that if, uh, given that we've said we don't want Iran to get a nuclear weapon, and if we don't get some kind of diplomatic deal, then the question you ask is, if Iran appears to be moving in that direction, um, do you then have to take military action, or do you do so preventively before they even have a nuclear weapons program, but to try and uh, destroy the infrastructure uh, that they might use as some point. Uh, the obvious objections to that are, I think, fairly uh, straightforward. Um, I mean, first of all, uh, I think it, it is the consensus of the national security community that the United States could not prevent Iran from having a nuclear weapons capability if it really wanted to. Uh, we could uh, delay the program. We can do damage to it in various ways, but they have the knowledge. They have the technology to do it. You can't get rid of that expertise by uh, by dropping bombs on Iran. So you can only delay it and put it off a while. Uh, second point is the surest way to convince Iran's uh, government that it really does need a nuclear weapon is to start dropping a lot of bombs on them. 
I mean, the reason countries get nuclear weapons is to provide a deterrent against external attack. That's why we have them. That's why the Soviet Union had them, why Russia has kept them. That's why China, India, and others uh, have gotten them. That's why Israel has a nuclear arsenal of its own as well. Well, if we decide to attack Iran, uh, we are going to empower the hardliners in Iran who might have been arguing for a long time that they needed to actually cross the nuclear uh, threshold. And then finally, we just have to recognize that war is uh, an unpredictable business. And once you start one, you can't be necessarily sure how it goes or how it ends. Um, there are lots of, uh, there's lots of instability already existing in that part of the world. And if the United States were to launch a war against Iran, um, we cannot be uh, completely sure that they would not retaliate against us in various ways that wouldn't necessarily be an existential threat, but which we would certainly uh, find to be quite unpleasant. So I think if you look at the full range of options, you know, do you do this nuclear deal or do you either have an unconstrained Iran that can pursue uh, a nuclear program without any limits, or the possibility of the United States launching yet another preventive war in the Middle East. I think it's pretty clear that the deal is uh, far preferable. Professor Walt, let's pause for just a moment for this message. Hey, all you good listeners, there are many reasons you might want to start up a blog or website. Maybe just a labor of love, or you want to join the conversation, or you want to show off your work and your portfolio to potential clients and employers. You could start a blog talking about all the great innovations going on at your company and have pictures of the company picnic up there and what so-and-so is up to at the company. That'll get you noticed. You won't be the first fired after that. Or a site about all the developments going on in your industry. That'll get you noticed by potential employers around the industry. So a lot of different ways you can do this, but you definitely want to do it. And because I'm one of a very small number of people who are VIP affiliates of Bluehost, I can get you the lowest rate they have on web hosting. And if you don't know what hosting is, you can find out about that in my free ebook. Get all of this stuff, the ebook, my video tutorial on this, and my publicity offer to get your blog off the ground at tomwoods.com slash publicity. I've been seeing another objection, and I realize that your point is not that the deal is perfect. Your point is that the deal is imperfect in the sense that it doesn't give the U.S. absolutely everything it wants, but in that sense, pretty much every agreement ever reached by any country is always going to be imperfect from that country's point of view, but that's what negotiation is. You, you give and take and, and so on, but one objection that I've heard is that Iran is the world's leading supporter of terror. And it's now going to get X billion dollars. I don't know if that's the release of frozen assets or whatever. And, of course, it's going to use that money to prosecute its terror around the world. How can we sit back and let this happen? Yeah. Well, your first point is exactly right. right? Any negotiation involves some compromise uh, on both sides. No party in a negotiation ever gets everything it wants. Um, you know, when you go out to buy a car, you would like someone to give you a Mercedes and you'd like to pay a dollar for it. And the dealer would like you to pay a million dollars, but in fact, you end up bargaining and you reach an agreement somewhere uh, somewhere in the middle. Uh, and that's true here. This uh, gives the United States and its other partners in the uh, negotiating group a lot of things we really wanted. Uh, in some respects, I think it's a better deal than I expected for a variety of reasons. Um, but it also does give Iran some things they wanted. In particular, they uh, made it clear, as I said uh, earlier, that they wanted to retain essentially the capacity to control the full nuclear fuel cycle, to have all of the uh, component ingredients there. So they were going to get some things out of it. They were also not going to agree to this deal if it didn't um, lead to a lifting of sanctions and the release of some of the money that had been uh, imp or impounded uh, for many years. And again, it's completely unrealistic to imagine that we could get Iran to do all the things we wanted and never have anything in it for them. I would add one other point here is we also want a deal that both sides have every reason to abide by. And if we had somehow managed to impose a completely one-sided deal on Iran, that would be the kind of deal many Iranians would be looking for ways to get out of. You know, maybe if politics in the world changed a little bit, they'd be trying to find a way to renege on it or weasel out of it. We want this to be a deal that gives us a lot of what we want, but also gives Iran enough of what it wants that it's going to live up to 
the deal. Now, on the second question, is this suddenly going to uh, raise uh, the, the danger that Iran's sponsorship of terrorism uh, creates? I mean, first of all, terrorism has become this incredible bogeyman in American political discourse. Uh, we don't like some of the things that Iran has done and some of the groups they have supported, but I think the idea that they are the world's greatest sponsor of terrorism is is just one of these cliches that gets uh, gets thrown around. In fact, some of the things that they have done are not uh, particularly significant threats to American interests. More importantly, I don't believe this deal is suddenly going to uh, ratchet up their uh, sponsorship in various ways. The reason they're agreeing to this is in part because the Iranian economy is hurting and because President Rouhani ran on a platform of reintegrating Iran into the rest of the world, into the world economy, and improving the lives of average Iranians. They're going to take uh, the money that they get both uh, the released funds and what they'll get from increased trade with the world and use that to uh, help rebuild things in Iran itself. I don't think they're going to be using this uh, to run around the world and uh, cause more trouble. I would just add one other point, and that is if you ask yourself who has done the most to destabilize the Middle East over the last 20 years, it, there's no question it's been us not Iran. Uh, the invasion of Iraq, for example, did more to destabilize the Middle East than anything Iran has tried to do in recent years. And we ought to bear that in mind when you hear lines like, you know, greatest state sponsor of terrorism and things like that. Do you have any thoughts on Chuck Schumer's opposition to the deal? I think uh, Schumer was uh, responding to uh, you know his own uh, cal political calculations of uh, what uh, you know his donors were uh, going to support and what his constituents uh, wanted to support. I was disappointed uh, because I think uh, his decision was unwise and, and his justification for it was not very persuasive. But I don't think anyone was particularly surprised uh, by uh, the position that he took. I don't think, in fact, it's going to have enormous impact on other Democrats as well, well maybe a, a handful of them. But I think everyone understood all along that he was going to oppose the deal. And people took that into account you know, many, uh, many weeks, if not months ago. Well, one final thing before I let you go. I'm sure you have studied this extensively, but I co-authored a book years ago with a guy named Murray Polner, who's been active in Jewish peace circles for a long time, and it really sticks in his craw when it's just taken for granted that when you say Jewish, you mean Likud. He said, that's not true. He says a lot of American Jews don't support the U.S. military actions that are supposedly in defense of Israel and Israeli interests. A lot of them think these wars are a terrible idea, even from an Israeli point of view. So why, why is it automatic that, that Schumer's constituency is necessarily going to be anti the agreement, when maybe it's not? Maybe he has a more diverse constituency than that. Well, I think what we're seeing here is the way in which uh, interest group politics often works, and not just on matters of foreign policy. Um, it, what you have here is, I think, a situation where uh, most of the opposition to this deal is coming from uh, organizations uh, that are w embedded uh, heavily within the American Jewish community, groups like APAC, groups like the Conference of Presidents, uh, many think tanks, uh, the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, uh, different groups that uh, people uh, like me and others have, have viewed as a sort of the broad coalition called the so-called Israel Lobby. Uh, the deal is supported by uh, J Street. Uh, a more peace-oriented uh, version of uh, the, or branch of, of the Israel lobby, I guess, and by groups like Americans for Peace Now. And the key thing to understand here is that many of these mainstream organizations like APAC and others are in fact not representative of the American Jewish community, and certainly not on this particular issue. They get a lot of attention, they have a, a, a lot of weight because they play a key role in shaping campaign contributions. There are wealthy donors like Sheldon A. Adelson and others who politicians like Schumer do pay attention to, uh, but they are not, in fact, representing the median voter uh, either in the United States or in the American Jewish community. And if you go back, for example, and look at the American decision to invade Iraq in 2003, 
these organizations uh, were very supportive of the war. They didn't necessarily come up with the idea, but when the Bush administration decided to do it, they backed it uh, and helped uh, and helped sell it. But if you look at public opinion polls of where the American Jewish community was, the American Jewish community was in fact less supportive on average of going to war than the American population as a whole, which just, just confirms uh, your point. These organizations, I think it's increasingly clear, are, are simply uh, not a reflection of where American Jewish opinion is. Uh, as you would expect, there's lots of, there's a range of views within America itself, and there's a range of views within the, or a range of views within the American Jewish community as well. Um, and I think that's becoming increasingly clear as this debate proceeds with groups uh, on all sides of the issue weighing in and letting, uh, uh, reminding us all uh, that there's a lot of diversity of thought within that community and uh, many others. Uh, this is episode number 475, so the show notes page will be tomwoods.com slash 475. I'll link to uh, your books there uh, on that page. I'll also link to your Twitter. I see, you, I see you're on Twitter. I'll link to your faculty page. But if people are interested in following your work, is there any other outlet I should direct them to? Uh, that I do a weekly column for Foreign Policy magazine. Uh, that they can find at foreignpolicy.com. Okay, and I, I guess I'll, I'll just link to, the, to your archive there. That'd be great. Okay, great. All right, well, I appreciate your time. I think this, is, this answers the questions that I had, and uh, I've wanted to talk to you anyway, and I'm glad we had the opportunity. I appreciate it. Thanks so much. No, no, no. pleasure talking with you. All right, everybody, tomwoods.com slash 475 is the show notes page. I want to say a word of thanks to... You good folks who make the Amazon purchases that you make through my Amazon link, you can just bookmark the link that comes up with tomwoods.com slash Amazon. That'll redirect to my Amazon link, and you could bookmark that. That really helped me out for when you're going to make your Amazon purchases because it, it allows me to have this office, to have an assistant, and now I'm even able to outsource the process of doing the audio for the show which is more time consuming than you would think and that has freed me up for instance to do a brand new ebook i'm going to do this ebook on bernie sanders and i'm going to give that away for free i'm also producing my definitive guide to self publishing and definitive guides to a whole bunch of other things that i think a lot of you will find useful i'm going to be giving all these things away for free and i now have the free time to do them because just by making your amazon purchases through that link at no extra cost to yourself you are freeing up my time to be able to do all these extra things and give away all this stuff for free. So tomwoods.com slash Amazon is where to go to help me out in that regard, and I really appreciate it. Tomorrow we're going to be talking about Keynesianism and Say's Law, a very important lesson in economic history. So make sure and tune in. See you then. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.